Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Today we have a very special session with a guest speaker. Uh, Aman is a PhD student at CMU and his research interest lies in uh, natural language generation and common sense reasoning. He has worked as a student researcher and collaborator with Google Brain and Allen Institute of AI. He was also a principal member of technical staff at Oracle. Uh, today he will be talking about code assisted reasoning with LLMs. So without wasting any time, uh, over to you, man. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. So let me share my screen. And okay. So you folks can see my screen, right? Yeah, we can see your screen. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about code assist assisted reasoning with LLMs. Um, this I'm mostly going to talk about my joint work with these amazing collaborators. So, you know, also go read their papers and see what they're up to. Uh, very cool stuff. So let's begin. So when we think of code generation models, you know, we think of things that can complete the code for us. So you have some function that's partly written, the program, the model can complete it. Uh, it can do cooler things like it can generate entire functions from natural language descriptions. So you write a pro you write a command, you know, write program to search Google for a given question, and it would do something that's uh, hopefully reasonable. So these are not the kind of things we are interested in. What we are interested in is, can we leverage these capabilities for reasoning tasks? So can we make these models shuffle and do things that they were, you know, not really trained for, and can are are they really better at doing those things? And the answer that uh, as we discuss later, is yes. So we can leverage capabilities for code generation for other more general reasoning tasks. So I'm going to talk about two different papers. The first one is called Cocogen, uh, which is about common sense reasoning. The second one is called PAL, which is using programs uh, for more mathematical reasoning and actually executing those programs. And then I'll talk about what's happening in the field and what are some things that you folks can look at and you know maybe work on and think about. Okay. Because we are a small group, feel feel to talk. Just stop me whenever there's a question. And if something is not making sense, don't have to wait till the end. Just, you know, raise your hand or just start talking and we can stop and discuss. So let's make use of the fact that it's just a small group. Okay. So let me start by talking about this paper called Cocogen, uh, language models of code are few short common sense learners. OK, so we are talking about these kinds of tasks that are structured common sense reasoning. And what I mean by that is you are given some natural language input. So say, bake a cake. And the goal is to create a graph to you know, bake a cake. So each node is an event, find recipe, gather ingredients, mix ingredients, and so on. And the edges are sort of dependencies. So before you can do anything, you have to know what the recipe is. And while you are gathering all the ingredients, you can start preheating the oven. And once you have prepared all the ingredients, the oven is ready, then you can put the cake in, and so on. Right? So it's a graph with different events. And we want to generate it with language models. So we want to take input scenario and generate this graph. Now, of course, we want to use language models, right? Because they are trained on lots of text. They have tons of common sense knowledge out of the box. So we want to leverage them. Um, so we want to go from this scenario here on the left to this graph on the right. But we need some intermediate representation, right? Because language models work with strings. So a popular way to do this is to just break the graph into edges. So you have a graph like this, which you want to generate with a language model. Uh, and you can just list all the edges. So find recipe to gather ingredients becomes one edge. Gather ingredients to mix ingredients become the second edge, and so on. So you can just list all the edges, say, from in some order of traversal. Train the language model to go from this scenario, this string, to this list of edges. Uh, and then finally, regenerate the graph from this intermediate representation, right? So flatten the graph and then train a seek to seek model and then recover the graph. And there are existing works that use this approach to a certain degree of success. 
so this works i mean this this is okay this this might work but what are sort of the problems with this workaround and to intuitively understand it if we look at the graph on the right and if i ask you uh look at the mixed ingredient nodes there's no ambiguity right it's right there it has some neighbors and so on but if you look at this text representation are these two mixed ingredients the same um well, they could be you will have to go through the whole set of edges to figure out and even then as a human it's not really all that easy to tell if they are the same nodes right you have to kind of recreate the graph in your head and of course what happens when the graph is larger, is more complex, more dense, things are going to get worse. So representing these kind of structures as flat strings is not very natural. Uh, and the ultimate tension, of course, is that we want to generate these structures, and these strings are only uh, an intermediate representation that may not be ideal. Right. So this is kind of our goal. We want to generate graphs, but we don't want to use these uh, unnatural representations, or we want to do better. So what is better than flat, just simply strings? Uh, and we propose its code. So our goal is that we would use programs to and to sort of represent these graphs. And what that would give us is that it would give us an opportunity uh, to better represent these structures. So instead of forcing language models of text to generate these text structures, we will sort of reframe our problem, and we want to generate code. So let me just show you an example. Uh, it's very simple. So you first, you have a target structure. So you want this is what you want to generate. So instead of representing it as string, we can represent this graph exactly as a Python class. right? So we say it's a class tree with a certain goal. Uh, the nodes can be some instances of node objects. So you have find recipe, gather ingredients, mix ingredients, and so on. And then you can say, OK, add edges, and dependencies are just children. right? So that's the first step. Whatever you want to generate, you can write a few examples, two or three examples as code. And then uh, we can create a few short prompt. And as most of you know, few short prompt is like a bunch of input outputs. Uh, so at test time, all you give to the model is this incomplete class, and the model is supposed to, you know, generate it. So complete the nodes and the edges. So that's kind of the high-level idea. So instead of using strings, use graphs or use code. Okay. Uh, and this is very effective. And I'll just focus on this results on on the left. So blue is T5XXL trained on the entire training set, which is 3,500 examples, or fine tuned on the entire training set, I'm sorry. Uh, da Vinci is text Da Vinci 02 with 15 examples, and CocoGen is Codex, again, with 15 examples. And as you can see, these are automated results. Uh, we also have human evaluation. But from these automated results, uh, CocoGen outperforms not only a text model, a model of text with the same number, same number of examples, but also a very large fine-tuned model. And it's kind of interesting because uh, text Da Vinci O2 we know now was actually based on Codex. So there's something interesting happening there. It's not only about generating graphs or just one kind of task. So suppose you have this task of predicting the location of an entity, right? So or some sort of entity state. So you have three entities in a process, say photosynthesis, uh, water, light, and CO2. Initially, water is in the soil, light is with the sun, CO2, we don't know where it is. And after the first action, uh, the location changes. So the water moves from soil to roots and so on. And suppose you want to sort of do this kind of prediction of, of entity states, then you can represent uh, this task as a program as shown on the right. Uh, so there's an init function that lays out initial positions of each of these um, entities. And then each action is a function that sort of transforms the state. Right. So it's very natural to represent this information 
uh, as program. And again, ProPara uh, on ProPara, CocoGen is the state of the art few short learning method with Codex. Okay, so before I kind of go ahead, uh, I'm assuming this makes sense. I see that some people joined late. So what I mentioned initially was, feel free to stop me. I don't have to go through the, the slide deck. We can end at midway, but it's important that you know, uh, you're know you all with me. So, okay, good. So stop me for questions if, if you want. Okay, so why does it work? So one hypothesis is that in the pre-training corpus, we have tons of uh, procedural knowledge. So there's, you know, there's tons of game engine code on GitHub, which has common sense knowledge about the world, for example, the process of pollination. A second hypothesis that I like more as to why language models of code and code assisted reasoning is so good is because uh, of things like this. So if you think about uh, the simple problem of co-reference. Uh, when you write programs, if you define a variable called gather ingredients, and if you want to refer to it, you have to use the same set of characters, right? You cannot rephrase, you cannot drop the middle name on things like that. Uh, so a language model of code has to be really good out of the box at this sort of co-reference and in keeping track of all the, the variables. Second thing is, uh, Code has um, as na very naturally has to encode things like dependencies, a recursion, hierarchy, and those things are very explicit in programs, but they are very implicit in natural language. So a language model of code or a language or a model trained on code has to be good at these things. And our hypothesis is that being good at these skills like co-reference and dealing with hierarchy helps in general. So that's kind of the first work. And now let me move to the second work, which is program aided language models. Um, yeah, so this is the paper link, et cetera, I'll share later. Uh, so let's look at this motivating example. Suppose we have a simple math problem. Sean has five toys for Christmas. He got two toys each from mom and dad. How many toys does he have now? Five initial, two from mom, two from dad. The answer is nine. And you know, in the past, you would collect some training data for input output, train or fine tune a model. And then at test time, you get some input and you generate some output. And of course, we don't do, we, we sort of, we mostly don't do that these days. A uh, few short prompting or in context learning or sort of autocomplete is very effective. So, what you instead have is you have a prompt. So, you have two or three examples of these input outputs. And there is no there is no training, there's no fine-tuning. You have a large model like GPT-3. You give this prompt and your question to the model. So in this case, we have two examples. Uh, example number one, question answer. Example number two, question answer, and then a new question. And the model sort of is supposed to answer it, right? But the design of prompt is super important. And one of the techniques that works really well is chain of thought prompting. Right, so bef before answering the question in chain of thought prompting, you insert some step-by-step -step reasoning process. So let's go through it because it will be important. So initially we have we have a question, Leah had 32 chocolates, her sister had 42. If they're 35, how many do they have left? Direct prompting would just generate this answer. The answer is 39 pieces. And chain of thought prompting adds this description, which sort of thinks about the problem out loud, generates an explanation, a reasoning chain. You know, it's like, yeah, take your pick. So the model, instead of generating the answer, would say things like, originally, Leah had 32 chocolates. Her sister, her sister had 42. So in total, they had 32 plus 42 equals 74, and so on. So you are like solving the problem. And this simple trick, okay, and one more thing is you, of course, don't have to write these explanations for every problem you're solving. So you just create a prompt with two or three examples, um, eight examples for most of the GSM 8K tasks. And at test time, the model generates both this so-called thought and the answer. And this technique is extremely effective. So on Palm 62B, for example, 
the sol rate of GSM 8K goes from 10% to 30%. So it's a three time, three times better. It's just this simple improvement, just the simple addition to the prompt of adding this thought. Um, okay, so this is great. But the problem here is that we are forcing the language model for both planning the solution and also giving us the answer. So the poor language model has to figure out that it has to add these two numbers, say 32 and 32, but also generate the answer to 64. And this kind of forcing the model to do both is going to hurt in many places, as we will see. But most obviously, it'll, you can, as you can imagine, it's going to hurt if the magnitude of numbers is large. So you know when we have these nice questions like three cars, two cars, three plus two five, it's all good because small numbers are everywhere on the web. So, but what happens when you increase the magnitude of numbers? So instead of three cars, if you have thirty two hundred cars and things like that. And what we find uh, in a different work is that when you do that, the accuracy drops by a lot. So here's what this graph is showing. We take a subset of GSM 8K examples that were being perfectly solved by this model, Palm 62B. Uh, for those questions that were being perfectly solved, all we do is we increase the numbers, say by adding 500 or 600 to each number. And just by doing that, the solve rate drops from 100% to 15%. And even if we use a much larger model, a 540B model, uh, it only pushes it to 25%. So this is an obvious fail failure mode. So we saw in the previous paper that it makes sense for certain tasks to represent your solutions as code and make the model generate programs instead of generating text. And as you can imagine, that the same insight sort of carries over here, but gives us much more. Uh, OK, one more problem with text-based explanations is that, of course, there is no guarantee that the answer will be right. right? So it's a language model. It can generate a completely wrong explanation and still generate the correct answer. And with programs, that will not happen. So here's the overview of our approach. Given a question, a COT will generate this text-based explanation, and we propose to generate a program. So the model is going to generate this Python program, dev solution, money initial 23, and so on and so forth, do the calculation, return result. And then instead of relying on the language model to give us the answer, we are going to send this program to a Python runtime. And the runtime is going to get us the answer. So in this case, the model is only responsible for generating sort of how to solve the problem and not responsible for additionally giving you the exact answer. Right. So let me close the window. It's getting a bit bright. Yes, please. OK, so I want to ask, what is the, uh, like when you were working at would uh, did you encounter any examples where the generated code itself was uh, had some error, some syntax error, or something like that? Yeah, that's a good question. So, in the even for so the answer is no, or the answer is less than five out of a thousand programs had any sort of error. So the program is almost always a valid Python program that will run without throwing any errors. Um, that was right. almost the case, yeah. And I think that's true even with very, very small models like CodeGen 350M. It's going to generate programs that are valid, syntactically valid. So that's no longer a problem. And as a funny side note, uh, Andre Karpati had this uh, blog post from 2016, the unreasonable effectiveness of RNNs. And even with the RNNs he shows in that blog, small RNNs, like generating syntactically valid structured output is not that challenging. The key is, is the output also correct? Uh, so highly recommend checking that out. Uh, let me close right. the window. Sorry.
Hey, yeah, please just uh, ask. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Aman. Really interesting presentation. I have one question that, um, as you said, that only five out of thousand examples uh, were wrong. Uh, huh. the, the generated code was wrong, but what about the logical errors? Because your solution might also generate the wrong code, which compiler might not throw the error off, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get a lot of those. So the task is not solved. That is true. So the challenge is that how do we push that accuracy? So generating structure evaluates, you're, you're right, and that happens a lot. So the task is not solved. If that was true, then we would just say, we would get 100 percent accuracy right got it thank you yeah. so much yeah i see there's one more question uh let me read i uh, i'm not sure like uh so i think the idea here is to generate code for a new problem so cython helps uh i'm not sure maybe you could clarify or we can chat later uh, and I think I, I was reading a few stuff on LLM evaluation and uh, what they did was to generate unit tests for that pro uh, problem. So I mm -hmm. think that can be an interesting approach that uh, in combination with code, we can also generate some test cases. Uh, we asked LLM to generate, think of some test cases that can fulfill that actual problem which is given. So I think that might be able to improve the the code or using categories. Absolutely. No, I think that's a good that's a good point. The interesting thing here to note is that if you are doing the usual program synthesis, so if I say add a program to write a program to add two numbers. Now in that case, writing unit test is a bit more straightforward. But for problems like these, like I have on the screen, like logical mathematical problems, there's only one good answer so generating the test case itself might be as difficult as solving the problem if that makes sense yeah that, that's an interesting point yeah but yeah i think in general i think it's uh there's something i think i saw a paper that does something similar but yeah it's a it's a good point yeah. cool so yeah that's the idea um and then we get the answer after actually running the program it's very effective. So as you can see, it's um, it's still the state of the art method, even with GPT-4. Uh, but these numbers are with codex. The light green bar is chain of thought. The dark green bar is PAL, which is generating programs, same model. And across different, different data sets, uh, we get very consistent gains. We can do things like self-consistency, which is a technique for improving the effectiveness of LLMs. So instead of drawing one sample or one program, we can generate 20 programs, or as or in this case, 40 programs. And then we run all of those 40 programs, and the majority is the answer. So we run, we generate 40 programs. If 30 of them generated five as the answer, we are going to generate five. We are going to give five as the answer. So if we do this, uh, self-consistency uh, decoding, then PAL with Codex outperforms uh, very strong models, including Minerva, which was, as you may know, is a 540B model, which was specially fine-tuned for dealing with mathematical problems by fine-tuning on LaTeX and data sets like that. OK, so we started by discussing this idea of large numbers so we also have those experiments so we create a new version of gsm8k that we call gsm8k hard so what we do is we take things like 12 dollars a month and we replace it programmatically with challenging numbers like this much i think 1.5 million a month uh, so we actually make these uh, changes and then cot generates a text-based solution for this challenging problem, and PAL generates a program. And as you can and imagine, for PAL, the accuracy does not drop by that much. It goes from 70 to 65. And that's mostly because, because we create this data set automatically. There's some noise. But for CRT, the, the fall is drastic. So it goes from 65-ish to you know, about 20. It completely uh, 
is to deal with it and you know for no fault of llm i mean it simply has not seen things like 1.5 million and 773 dollars and so it's it's challenging but it's not only about that so there's i think philosophically there's more happening here let me show maybe a slightly better example okay so suppose let's look at this task repeat the phrase all cars eat gas four times so you have to repeat this phrase four times on the odd times, you have to drop the words that start with vowels, right? So this phrase is repeated four times. And the words that start with vowel has to be dropped. So the eat, the E has to be dropped. So all cars eat gas. If that's A and E are dropped on the first time, so cars gas. Second time, you repeat the phrase again, all cars eat gas. And third time, you drop all and eat and so on now if you're doing chain of thought prompting this is what it's going to generate not only is it terrible to read it's kind of uh so as you can imagine not only is this impossible to read it's also doesn't make much sense right so it's saying i have to repeat this phrase that is all cars eat gas this many times oops sorry right so you have to the text based explanation is I have to repeat this phrase, I have to drop over things like that and compare it with the solution on the right that's using Python. It's so much more sexy. So if it's uh, you have this list of things that you want to add, uh, if it's an even time, you just add it. If I is if I mod two is not zero, which means if it's an odd turn, then you see if the word is uh, of vowel and then you add it, right? So as programmers in this room, I'm sure all of you would agree that the solution on the right is much more effective, much more succinct explanation and solution of the same problem. And that's kind of a nice side effect of doing program-aided uh, language modeling, language addition. And of course, we not only get these nice programs to solve these weird problems, we also improve the accuracy across different tasks, data understanding, colored objects, penguins on a table. These are all tasks from this uh, benchmark called Big Bench that some of you might be familiar with. OK, so one interesting thing that we saw in this work is what kind of programs help? Like, can you just write some code and get it done with? And the answer is no. So if you see uh, on the left, we have three different versions of this program. The first one is no variable, like A, B, C, horrible variable names, and no comments at all. In the second, we have the same terrible variable names, but we have nice interleave comments. So you see text and code is interleaved. You have a line of text, then you have code, line of text and code, and so on. In the third case, we have uh, a single program with very informative variable names. And the logic is the same for all of these. So we have three different kinds of prompts, essentially. And PAL gets 71.8. And when we go to the first version, which is no comments and bad variable names, then we see a drastic drop. Um, and the performance falls below the performance of chain of thought reasoning. What that means is that the model is leveraging knowledge of these variables to reason and to generate the solution. And it does help a lot if you have nice interleaved comments in addition to uh, the variable names. Right? So this is kind of an insight that I saw a paper yesterday that we'll, I'll also quickly mention. You, uh, it's called 5.1. And this is, I think, their, uh, the premise of the paper is that if you have nice code like this, which interleaves with text and has good comments, good variable names, then that's much more efficient. Uh, but that's what we found also in PAL. OK, most of the results were on Codex, but what about other models? Uh, so we do see gains after a certain size of the model. So let me start with this figure on the right, the red and blue thing. So what it's showing is takes the Vinci O1, which is probably the smallest model. We did not see gains with PAL. In fact, we see a large performance drop. So it's much worse to do PAL. However, if you have a slightly stronger model, then PAL starts shining, and it keeps helping 
up until GPT uh, and also uh, newer models like star coder on the left, uh, which was mostly trained on code. And here also COT um, is quite uh, it's quite quite worse than doing PAL. Llama, I think, has uh, mixed results, but overall, after a certain size, so as you can see, 7B and 13B, chain of thought prompting is slightly better. But the moment you go to 33B, uh, PAL takes over. Right, so that's kind of one thing that uh, is is interesting to see here. Okay, so we saw Cocogen, which is when you have to solve some task, you can trick a language model of code or language model in general into generating some program, and then use that program as the answer. Uh, you can generate programs as the solution, and then pass that program to a runtime to get the answer. And now let's see what's happening in this space and related space and what we can work on. Yes, please. Okay, so question? just a, just a quick question. Uh, so there are a few problems that uh, I don't think that are very like uh, concretely that can be very concretely solved by code. Mm -hmm. So 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 for so, so for example, I was working uh, doing chat GPT on a problem that uh, if a phrase a is inside a paragraph B. So if kind of it, so I was not looking at exact the exact phrase. So even if the contents were somewhat similar, so, I, so that would be equivalent to it is in uh, the paragraph B. So I was using chain of thought and it was giving quite good results as compared to simple prompting. So I don't think that kind of problems are solvable by code uh, by default. So like do you think it, there, is, there is a better structure or something like that? Sorry. No, I completely agree. I don't think that all kinds of problems uh, can be solved or should be solved with code. Um, you mentioned an example of like searching in text. One way in which I think you can still leverage some sort of uh, program aided reasoning is if you have different APIs for searching. So for example, if you're searching, if you're doing grip versus you are calling elastic search and things like that, and you can generate a high level plan of what kind of search to do with an LLM, uh, which would be some sort of program and then use those respective tools to actually solve the problem. But yeah, in general, I, I do agree that it's, uh, it's not true that all problems will admit yeah, program aided solutions. Yeah, that's true in general. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So I think one thing is that the community is, as you can see, you know, benchmarks are kind of getting, uh, it's not very, it's tricky. The whole thing is tricky. So we are seeing for, for techniques like PAL, the good thing is you do see applicability to a large set of problems. So we have these examples from the PAL paper. On um, going beyond benchmarks, so if your problems like how many letters are in the word intriguing, and these things used to be very challenging for language models, but if you ask the model to generate a program, they are not. And Bard recently, just last week, got uh, something called implicit code execution. So if you ask Bard to solve a problem of the sort that we saw, you know, John has five apples, someone else has ten apples. How many apples do they have? And if you say generate code, then it's going to do this PAL style reasoning and generate a program for you. And I saw this, which is sort of interesting. It's like CocoGen in the wild. So I'm not sure if you folks, uh, maybe you guys saw that the OpenAI has this thing of function calling now. So you can ask the API to generate a function call. Now this is going to be slightly meta, so maybe it's not clear, but I'll try my best. So in CocoGen, the idea was that you are tricking the model into generating some code, right? So you want to generate a graph to bake a cake. Of course, you don't want a Python class to bake a cake. That's just a means to an end. That's only a way to get a good graph for baking the cake. So you sort of trick the model and say, hey, model, generate this class for me. Don't worry about it. And then you take the class and do whatever you want with it. And this is the same example. So what this person here is doing is uh, they're calling OpenAI's you know, function calling API. And they're saying, look, 
there's a function that prints the sentiment. So there's a function called print sentiment. Now, given some text, I want to call this function with the right sentiment. So generate a function call, right? So if you have a review like the pizza was amazing, uh, the call to print statement should have the argument positive. And this, this is generated with uh, open AS call. So this is exactly the idea behind CocoGen that you don't really want to generate code. You're just using it as a way, a means to an end. Um, so there's a wide range of tasks where you can use this kind of reasoning, like generating event graphs, uh, as shown here. And I recently saw this paper prompting with pseudo code instructions where they extend it to a, a whole variety of tasks, including some sort of very text heavy task where I would have not guessed that these things will work. But um, there's other applications like robotics. You can generate policies uh, to manipulate robots as programs and then run those policies. So this policy can come from a language model, pure, pure text-based language model. And then a multimodal model could, for example, improve it with feedback or execute it and so on. So it does not always work. Uh, like we were discussing. So uh, I recommend checking out this paper where they do an exhaustive study on when does it work and when does it not work. And they find the results are mixed. Uh, it's not very clear. And I think it's a very interesting open problem. Like, can we predict when will these things work? Is there something nice about the problem itself? And one idea there could be, like we saw in the repeat phrase example, it was just so much more succinct to describe the problem in program, and it was just so much more terrible to do it in text. So maybe there's something there. Um, and this composing com composition of different tools is also very interesting and something I was talking about earlier. So you can have uh, a prompt that takes your question and then generates code that can decompose the question and then call smaller models to solve each of the tasks. And I think I recently saw some work that's kind of touching this theme. OK, finally, uh, in PAL, we stress a lot on interleaving text and code and writing, generating high quality code. And I saw this paper yesterday, believe me or not. Uh, it's called Textbooks Are All You Need. Uh, and it's a, very, it's, an, it's a very good work. And I think um, what they find is that if you train your model on code with high educational value, and what they mean is code with nice variables, with inline functions, uh, sorry, with functions factored out. So it should not be like you know your typical researchy code that I end up writing a lot. Uh, should be nice comments. If you train or fine tune your model on this code, then you get huge gains on benchmark data sets like human eval. So it's phenomenal uh, the kind of numbers they get. OK, so here's a TLDR, which is that if you have a task that you can convert to code, definitely try it. It may work. It may not work. But it it likely work, and it will likely give you something. Uh, and the code should be high quality. Try to write it like a story, almost as if you're describing something. Uh, and code and text are heavily interleaved. And if you're interested, so there's some pointers for checking out our uh, GitHub repos for code prompts and things like that. So yeah, happy to uh, take any questions. But thanks again for listening to me. So that's all I had. Yes, please. Yeah, you can just ask questions. So I have a thought in mind that what if before generating the code to execute it, what if we ask the model to, you know, perform the thinking just like it does in COT. So it thinks step by step, it formulated the problem, and then ah. it write the code instead of directly start writing the code. Yeah, I think that's uh, the pseudo code prompt paper. You may want to check it out. Uh, I think that's their, I think they do touch it, they do touch upon it. So, so do both, right, is what I guess you're saying. So do COT first, and then do or generate yes. program. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a promising direction. Then I will not be surprised if it works. 
the only thing is when you're doing too many of those things, there are two points of failure, right? So what you're doing here is you're saying, or your prompts will have programs that are conditioned on the text or on the chain of thought. So if the chain is wrong, then the poor model is sort of obliged to condition on it regardless. So you have two points of failure now. And usually when things are set up this way, um, it might be tricky to get it to work, but you know it's worth trying. Yeah, Maybe you can give examples of ignoring the chain if the chain is wrong in the prompt, for example. Also, have you guys evaluated your results with the tree of thought that also came after a chain of thought? Uh, no, uh, we have not. But I think it's like a search approach that I think is complementary and may also, I think it may give further improvements too, uh, but to this kind of setup. But I think there, the idea there is like sort of orthogonal to what kind of prompts you use, text or code. Oh. Oh. Yeah, I think uh, we can end the call here. Thank you so much for the insightful talk. It was uh, wonderful and I really enjoyed it. Nice. Yeah. I'm happy to do that. Thanks again for inviting me. It's nice to see all of you. Oh.